Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Doug Clark, Dean of the College of Chemistry, and it's great to have all of you with us this morning. Just last Saturday, the College of Chemistry officially turned 150 years old. And over the last century and a half, our college has educated and supported the research of some of the world's most outstanding scientific leaders of the kind that we have joining us here today and has produced extraordinary scientific discoveries and innovations. To mark this illustrious 150th anniversary, we are using this milestone year as an opportunity to celebrate our college's continuum of excellence and impact on society with a number of virtual and in-person events. Today's event is the first in a series of virtual panel discussions where our world-renowned faculty discuss their latest research on current topics in the chemical sciences and engineering. Today's panel will address climate sustainability and will be facilitated by Professor Jeff Reimer. So let me say just a few words about my colleague, Jeff. Jeff is currently the chair of our chemical and biomolecular engineering department, a position he has held with distinction, not once, but twice for a remarkable 14 years. He is also the C. Judson King Endowed Professor and the Warren and Catherine Schlinger Distinguished Professor. Jeff's scholarship is in the fields of materials chemistry and engineering, with particular emphasis on the application of sophisticated NMR techniques and physical measurements. The overall goal of Jeff's groundbreaking and interdisciplinary research is to generate new knowledge that will deliver environmental protection, human sustainability, and fundamental scientific insights via materials chemistry, physics, and engineering. Jeff has been recognized for his outstanding work in many ways and with many accolades, and has also received the UC Berkeley Distinguished Teaching Award, the highest award bestowed on faculty for their teaching. So it is now my great pleasure to hand the floor over to Professor Jeff Reimer. Well, thanks, Doug. Um, I have to say, I wish my mother were around to hear that, uh, that introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dean Clark. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to our event today at the College of Chemistry. I, I'm especially pleased today to be able to introduce three of my faculty colleagues to you at this forum. And I'll, I'll provide uh, more details about their biographies as I introduce them. But broadly speaking, let me just say that Jay Kiesling, Pei Dong Yang, and Ron Cohen are three extraordinary members of the Berkeley faculty. All three are very famous. All three have published extensively and have bibliometric impacts that are above reproach. All three are members or fellows of famous societies, and all three have directed at one point in time various research institutes at the Berkeley campus. So they are indeed well qualified to both represent the college and this important topic of climate sustainability. So let me just say how I think our hour will work together. Uh, I will introduce and post questions to each speaker individually. And after their response, I'll turn to the next professor and so forth. And at the end, you'll have a chance to post questions to them. But you can ask your questions anytime by enabling the Q&A box at the lower right-hand portion of your Zoom screen. If you pull that box up, you can type a question in any time uh, and, uh, and we will get to those questions at about 12.35 or so, all going well. And I'll read your questions uh, for our uh, professor guests, and uh, then we can hear the responses. And uh, let me just say thank you again uh, for coming here today and being a part of this important topic. So let's get started, shall we? Um, uh, professor Jay Kiesling. Uh, is a member of the chemical engineering faculty and is probably best known as a metabolic engineer and a synthetic biologist, as well as for being the CEO of JBay, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, uh, DOE funded, that's uh, nearby here in Emeryville. You may recall that some years ago, Professor Kiesling received considerable notoriety in mainstream media for his ability to modify yeast so that it could produce uh, artemisinic acid, a critical and rate limiting step towards producing anti-malarial drugs. He's well known for the friendly synthesis of drugs, chemicals and fuels, and has recently published articles on sustainable manufacturing with synthetic biology and the microbial production of biofuels. 
Jay, uh, as I look down here on the screen, it's nice to see you this afternoon. Appreciate very much your coming here. And, and let me just start with a broad question, which is that biofuels have received a lot of attention in recent years, and particularly some negative attention owing to the fact that they may stress the food production system and the environment uh, in which uh, production of those crops happens. So how do you see biofuels effort, the biofuels efforts as a sustainable enterprise, given these many, many criticisms? Well, first, Jeff, thanks for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate being invited here to this uh, panel. Um, so let's just talk about biofuels. Um, so, so biofuels have received a lot of attention. Uh, we've been working on producing biofuels from cellulosic biomass. So this is not necessarily the biomass that you would eat as food, but biomass that might be uh, trees that have fallen down in forests, say that might burn later in California. Uh, it could be uh, the residues from crops like corn and wheat and rice. Um, it could also be uh, purpose-grown plants uh, on marginal lands like sorghum. These would then be deconstructed, uh, pulled apart into their various components, and then converted into biofuels. Now, there's been a lot of talk about um, electrification of uh, automobiles. And uh, if you drive down Berkeley, you might think, wow, the whole the whole planet is going to be electrified in no time. But, but first of all, it's a small fraction of the cars on the road. If you just look at an average over the US or an average over the world, it's a, it's a very small fraction. And the average car stays in the fleet for 15 years. So even if we stop producing cars in uh, uh, gasoline cars in 2035, we'll still have, on, have them on the road until 2050. And so, first of all, we need a solution for the petroleum fuels that we're burning and that's putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The, the second, I think, important reason to have biofuels is uh, for planes, things that will probably not be electrified, at least in, in my future. You know, there are all these startups now that, that are promising electrified planes and there'll be small prop planes that will go a few miles that will be electrified, but planes that are going to cross oceans will not be electrified anytime soon. And we need sustainable fuels that will not add additional carbon to the atmosphere for those. Um, I mentioned using cellulosic biomass as a starting material for producing those fuels. Our goal is not to displace food production. Our goal, in fact, is to plant um, energy crops on, on marginal lands, things that maybe wouldn't be ideal for food crops, um, and to use the residues from food crops and from forests um, that might go otherwise unutilized. And I think with this you know, combination of feedstocks and producing fuels, we can have something, we can have both our food and our fuels and not jeopardize food and the prices of food. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, second question, maybe uh, just briefly. So broadly speaking, how is synthetic biology sustainable relative to the traditional chemical syntheses that I learned when I was a student? Yeah, so, so um, if you produce these products uh, using biology, and biology is really powerful in terms of being a catalyst, you can produce them from uh, feedstocks uh, that essentially have grown from carbon in the atmosphere. Sunlight and carbon dioxide are taken up by plants. You can use engineered microbes to then convert those sugars uh, and aromatic components in the plant into these various products. If you produce a product uh, like a carpet or something like that, that you don't burn later and return that carbon to the atmosphere, that product itself can be carbon negative, not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative. And so that's how synthetic biology can be sustainable and renewable. Great, thank you, Jay. Um, we'll come back to you in the Q&A. Uh, let me just remind the audience one more time that uh, questions for the panelists are entered in the Q&A panel in the lower right part uh, of your Zoom screen. So um, yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, I'd like to turn my attention right now to my colleague, Professor Pei Dong Yang, 
uh, professor of physical chemistry here at, at Berkeley. Um, earlier this century, he became famous for his work on nanostructures for photonic and energy applications, including, for example, ultraviolet nanowire lasers. Most recently, he is heavily involved in using nanotechnology for the purpose of artificial photosynthesis. He's currently the director of the Kavli Energy Nanoscience Institute here at Berkeley. And Pedong, it's a delight to be with you here today. And let me ask you uh, my question, which is that nanotechnology and in particular nanoparticles have received a great deal of negative attention uh, in the media, particularly for the environmental impact and health impacts of such tiny particles. Given all this negative attention, what do you see as the appropriate role and way to think about nanotechnologies as a sustainable climate mitigation approach? Thanks, thanks, Jeff, for the uh, kind uh, introduction. It's my pleasure to be on this panel. Um, so let's talk about nanotechnology um, for the for our sustainable future. Um, indeed, I, I think after more than three decades of research and development in this very broad area of nanoscience, we have been made significant progress. And the many materials that only exist decades ago, now it's possible to make them. And these new nanomaterials are enabling a collection of these new energy technologies or information technologies that's not even possible decades ago. For example, uh, nano, nanomaterials are being used in these uh, high, highly efficient solar cells. Nanomaterials are being used to produce clean hydrogen or liquid fuel from sunlight as the renewable energy input to reduce the carbon footprint. And the nanomaterial is being used in many of these high density batteries. And nowadays we're used for energy storage on our cell phone or also on our electric vehicle. Um, they are also being used for carbon dioxide capture, storage, they are being used in the high definition display, TV displays, like in our, our cell phone as well. And of course, we all know the, the transistors that's processing all of our information is getting smaller and smaller. Now it's getting down to like uh, below five nanometer nodes so that we can process more information, store more data with less energy needs. So those are all very, very promising. There are many, many of these good examples that uh, these nanomaterials enable. And of course, that being said, we are all aware of the, all of some of these negative sort of uh, potential implications, potential environmental impact of these nanoparticles could have. Um, people are worried about the contaminations, environmental pollutions by these nanoparticles. Uh, for example, we are increasing aware of these problems associated with the microplastics, nanoplastics in our ocean. Uh, they certainly are causing safety and the health concern. And we have electronic waste concerns because nowadays electronics is everywhere. So battery is another example. Have now batteries everywhere, of course, we do need to think about recycle these battery waste before it become a really an environmental disaster. So that really means that we need to develop responsible technology, nanotechnology to address all of these energy and the environmental issue what we're talking about. So when we implement these new technologies that's enabled by these nanoscience, we do need to take a holistic, holistic system level planning so that we can carefully evaluate, for example, the life cycle of these key components, key chemical elements within these uh, technologies. For example, recycling of the battery waste itself, it certainly is a big environmental issue, but it's also related to a much bigger question about how can we reuse recycle of these different elements, which is not necessarily always sort of unlimited. And so the, we need to utilize these uh, sort of elements like uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, for example. Okay? They are not necessarily unlimited. So we have to recycle them 
and the reuse them, that basically keep us on a sustainable path. So I, I think a key principle here, nanoscience indeed are enabling lots of these new technology. However, the key principle of a responsible development of such technology is to protect human health by solving all these energy environmental issues. And also meantime, understanding not just the big impact in terms of the nanoscience itself, but also you understand the potential implications in the environment. So like everything else we are doing, the principles of the sustainable chemistry is indeed important when we're talking about using nanoscience to solving our energy and the environmental problems. Yeah, thank you, Peidong. Um, I'm reminded of that reduce, recycle, reuse uh, paradigm that we often heard and uh, in many cases have taught our children. So uh, thank you uh, very much for that. Let me just turn now uh, to my colleague, Professor Ron Cohen. Uh, Ron is an atmospheric chemist historically associated with studies of ozone transport across the Pacific and uh, how the isotopes of water fractionate when it evaporates. More recently, he's been looking at the reduction of air pollutants in China during these recent years, and also how extreme weather events across the United States drives carbon fixation via photosynthesis. For 10 years, Ron was the director of the Berkeley Atmospheric Science Center, and he continues to direct an educational and outreach hub for K-12 students. So Ron, uh, thank you again and welcome today. Uh, let me start also with a broad question. Um, you know, these dilute components of the atmosphere, such as ozone or carbon dioxide or the oxides of nitrogen, they seem like such very, very small quantities, parts per million in typical cases. So how is it these small quantities have an effect on our planet? Ron? Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that kind introduction and thanks to the uh, college for uh, organizing this symposium. It's a it's a pleasure to follow my two colleagues. I think of myself as um, as part of the life cycle analysis that Peidong was just talking about, and as uh, the atmospheric piece of the check on whether or not uh, these other threads that we're talking about are effective at uh, making our planet a, a healthy place to live and um, a, preserving a viable future. Um, what we do in my research is we observe chemicals in the air, uh, and we do that for the purpose of thinking about the question you just asked, Jeff, how do those chemicals intersect with the health of communities? And, for, uh, and also for looking at uh, whether the activities that you just heard about from both of my colleagues about reducing greenhouse gases in different ways with different technologies are effective. So we measure both the nitrogen oxides you asked us about and the greenhouse gases. Uh, nitrogen oxides are uh, trace chemicals and uh, the way that they impact the atmosphere and our health is mostly through catalysis. What they do is they speed the creation of ozone and fine particles that are also are in small quantities, but quantities that are damaging to our lungs and pass through the uh, the blood barrier in our lungs and can uh, contribute to heart ailments and brain ailments as well. Uh, so we track very closely the way, the chemical ways that we make small particles in the atmosphere. The ones that we worry about are classified as PM 2.5 because their size is 2.5 microns. Uh, for a reference, your hair is about 80 microns uh, and particles of that size are small enough that they go deep into your lungs. So that's one thread. And then the parallel thread is, uh, as you heard from both my colleagues, thinking about CO2. CO2 is a major greenhouse gas. Its natural level in the atmosphere is about 200 parts per million. Uh, right now, we're, uh, we've almost doubled that. I guess it was 270 in 1880. And now we're at about 420. Uh, and CO2 is the blanket that keeps us warm. Uh, absent CO2, the entire planet would be frozen. Uh, and the added CO2 uh, increases the temperature of the atmosphere uh, a, a few degrees for every uh, tens of parts per million. So a, a doubling of CO2 is going to increase the temperature of that atmosphere 
about uh, seven Fahrenheit. And that's a long held old number. Uh, Svante Arrhenius first calculated that number in 1896, uh, more, more or less on the back of an envelope while he was uh, in the middle of an ugly divorce and sealed himself in a room to uh, wash his wounds or whatever we would say. Uh, and uh, sophisticated climate models uh, developed since then uh, have uh, more or less come to that same number. Uh, and more or less uh, the earth is shining light back to space, infrared light at wavelengths we don't see. And uh, if CO2 is in the atmosphere, that light can't escape. And so at other colors, also colors we don't see, the planet has to warm up to transmit more light to space to stay roughly equal the amount of energy coming from the sun and the amount of energy the planet puts back. Uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, really small quantities of chemicals in the air make a big difference both for the climate and for our health. Um, and it's important for us to complete this life cycle analysis that Peilong was talking about. And uh, the role of chemists in my part of the space is to uh, watch what's in the air and understand that so that we can uh, share with our colleagues the collective job of making sure we're on a safe track to improving life on Earth. Thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate that. Um, before we turn over to question and answers, I'm going to go back around with Jay, Peidong, and Ron one more time for a, a, a sort of an unscripted question off the top of your head. What is it you don't know that you really think you need to know to make progress in, in your research area? What is it you don't know to make progress in your research area? Let's start with uh, Jay Keesley. I don't know how to predict the price of petroleum. And <laughs> if I could, uh, then, then uh, uh, that might make uh, biofuels an easier sell. So just for some perspective, JBay was started in 2007. In 2007, uh, the price of oil was just shy of $150 a barrel right up there. And a few days ago, you know, it went up and looked like it was going to go there. Now it's settled back down a bit. But um, Biofuels look pretty good at $150 a barrel. They don't look so good at $30 a barrel. And to be perfectly frank, because we don't you know, fully price uh, the, the cost of petroleum-based fuels, the carbon that we can't remediate out of the atmosphere, um, it's really hard for biofuels to uh, compete. And so if I could predict the price of oil um, or if I could predict if our government would put a price on carbon, then I could better predict if we could have biofuels. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, how about it, Pedong? What, what is it you don't know that you think you need to know? Mm. Well, uh, of course, we're facing a very, very urgent sort of energy and environmental problem. So one thing I don't know is uh, I don't know when the next big breakthrough that I will be able to I'm talking about scientific big breakthrough that's being able to you we can use them to do, for example, CO2, complete CO2 capture and the conversion so that we can moving into this uh, carbon negative society. Um, that's something we cannot predict. However, I think we're, we're making progress. Great, thank you. Ron, what do you say? So I'm going to be. Uh stay a little bit more in my lane than my colleagues and not go to things that are out of my control. Uh, what, what we'd most like to learn in the next few years is uh, more about the intersection between uh, climate warming and warming in cities and the poor air quality that contributes to poor health and how that's connected both across the city and then distributed unfairly between communities that are living closer to our highways and in more poverty than in wealthier communities that are living further away. Great, thanks, Ron. I'll uh, just presume for a minute before we turn to Q&A. Uh, my, my own research, which 
uh, tends to, uh, has focused lately on carbon capture and materials and processes that are associated with carbon capture. And, um, you know, what I don't know is I don't know how to drive the price of carbon capture down to less than $100 a ton captured from direct air. And uh, a carbon negative um, society is going to require some direct air capture at some point in time, in addition to Jay's biofuels and pay donks, uh, incredible uh, technologies and Ron's deeper understanding of the atmosphere. We all know we have to pull it down and our governments, let alone the taxpayers, are not willing to spend $600 a ton to pull CO2 out of the air. And the chemistry of how to get uh, materials to pick up carbon, a lot of carbon, and a lot of carbon very quickly in order to run industrial processes is really vexing. And uh, that's what I don't know, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get an answer to that soon. So uh, thanks again to my colleagues. Let me uh, turn now. Uh, I would like to look at the question and answer box. So reminder, if you haven't had a chance to do so on the lower right hand side of your Zoom screen, you'll see a thing that says Q&A. You click on that, it opens up a box and you're, uh, you could type in your question. And um, I'll, uh, I'll start looking at these questions now. And uh, the first two questions, maybe the first three questions, maybe the first four questions, Jay, seem to fall into your, uh, your world. Let's start with uh, water uh, consumption and clean water consumption uh, in terms of uh, the bioprocesses that you're intending to do. And I might just interrupt and say, um, the water consumption to run carbon capture on coal-fired and natural gas power plants is, is extreme. And there are certainly parts of the world where it can't be done because the water consumption is too high. So Jay, I'll flip it over to you for biofuels. Sure. Um, well, that's a, a great question because uh, water is uh, uh, one of our limitations and certainly in California, it's a big limitation. Jay Bay works on uh, crops that don't need as much water. So for instance, example, we're working on sorghum right now. Sorghum is farmed in many parts of the country, uh, and it's farmed because it requires less water. And we're working with some variants that require even less water than those. Uh, and then if you look at how biofuels are produced in other parts of the world, say Brazil, um, there's, there's um, the use of a lot of conservation technologies, not just in, in uh, water, but also in fertilizers. So I think that there's a, a potential path forward. And if we look to using trees uh, from say California forests, something like that, um, then, then those you know, grow naturally, but I, water is a big challenge. Um, the second one I think you wanted to address was the billions or trillions of trees and carbon sequestration. And this is probably a better question for, for Ron or you than, than for me. I will note that I think that we can produce uh, plants and crops at about $100 a dry ton. So maybe that's our sequestration method. The, the challenge is we have to bury those and not let the carbon back up into the atmosphere. Ron, you want to comment? I'll, I'll, I am, Jay has that right. I think, you know, the large scale planting of trees uh, could conceivably buy us some a short amount of time, but uh, we can't plant enough trees and burn fuels at the rate we're doing it right now. There's just not enough land. But the alternative proposal of growing crops and then burying the carbon somehow, um, that that's that that allows you to use the land continuously, and so you know maybe there is a strategy there that allows us to sequester enough carbon to make a difference. Um, it's really, you know, it, it's it's valuable to calculate for yourself how much carbon you individually you you create each year. You know, it's probably you know more than the volume of the house you live in, or substantially more. And so when you think of trying to put that somewhere physically and just bury it somewhere, the, the amount of volume you're trying to bury is really incredibly high. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I think, um, I think there are interesting ideas emerging uh, that are sort of outside our uh, sphere, but Marin Carbon Project, uh, there, are, there are people looking at soil carbons and, and uh, so trees isn't the only way natural processes can sequester carbon. I think there's a lot of very exciting uh, research and progress going on there. 
So uh, David, I hope, I hope that answers your question. And Suverna, I, I think Jay already answered that, particularly with regard to sorghum. So uh, I'm gonna jump then to Jim Trainin's question, Peidong, which I think is for you, which is what is the current lifetime of artificial photosynthetic cells and what are the barriers to increasing that lifetime? Okay, so I, I think this question is related to our current research on the um, artificial photosynthetic system that's enabled by the uh, semiconductor nanostructure uh, and also bridging with the uh, sort of microorganism to do the electrochemistry for us. So, um, and that along that direction, certainly we, we were able to demonstrate CO2 fixation using sunlight and without any external energy input. Okay, so it's a renewable way to fix CO2 into liquid fuel. Uh, however, I think there are always lots of questions about the stability of these sort of uh, um, inorganic system, how they interact with the biological system, what's the lifetime of these, uh, these uh, energy conversion cells. Um, I, I think I can address that uh, one actually is their lifetime typically depend on with what sort of microorganism we are using. And some of these microorganisms have their life basically is fairly short couple of days. In certain systems, we run these systems like in several weeks or months. Okay, that's one sort of in the in the laboratory scale. And of course, another I think major advantage of our concept on the uh, photosynthetic biohabits is these microorganisms we are using to drive the CO2 reduction. They can be self-generating. Okay? They can basically have this self-generation capability. So, uh, in terms of the, in that sense, if we're designing a reactor, let, let's say it's a flow flow reactor, then we will automatically solve those issues. Okay, so so I, I think the lifetime is uh, certainly something we worry about, but not, it's probably not the main thing we worry about. We, what we mainly worry about is actually is the ultimate energy conversion efficiency, because in order to have a viable technology uh, that we can fix CO2 into liquid fuel, we do need a very high, actually fairly high energy conversion efficiency. I would say I'm mean, just put on the table. It has to be about 10 percent. I'm talking about solar to chemical energy storage efficiency. If we cannot reach that state, then this is going to be a science sort of a science project in the lab. Now, you know, once we can ap approach this level of a very high energy conversion efficiency, then you can think about a scale up to this technology really to make this big impact. Okay. So I, I think, uh, again, we have multiple directions are working on in terms of how to improve the energy efficiency and also designing sort of different type of reactor for that purpose. Um, I see Jeff want, would like to answer. So let me just, let me just uh, segue then quickly. Do you know what the uh, conversion efficiency is for photosynthesis in plants? And what is that relative to uh, the best sunlight to fuels that you're aware of in the research literature? This is Suverna's question. Yeah, uh, so in, in the natural system, of course, if you talk about the leaves, typical plants, we're talking about less than 1%, 0.5%. Sugar cane is a little bit high, I think 4 uh, or 5%. Okay? And however, nowadays in our sort of photosynthetic biohabit system, uh, we are being able to not necessarily making very sophisticated sort of uh, uh, molecules. We're making C two carbon, three carbon, four carbon with energy conversion efficiency, solar to chemical, about 4%. Mm -hmm. And these are again, basically is told with the complete energy input from sunlight. And one thing I don't know, I think in early on, I said one thing that uh, I don't know is when we will have next big, big breakthrough that really move this, uh, this uh, milestone towards larger than 10%, close to 15%. 
Okay, so these are the progress being made in the lab, but we will never predict when we will hit that milestone. And how this, once this, uh, we hit this milestone, how can we quickly sort of uh, uh, scale, scale up the technology, really make a big impact towards these uh, carbon neutral and the carbon negative uh, solution. Great, thanks. Um, Ron, I'm going to ask you to pick up on a Julia's question, and anonymous attendee will get to politics in a little bit. But uh, uh, Ron, do you see Julia's question, which is, you know, CO2 emissions are skyrocketing, and what is the evidence that CO2 will flatten if the appropriate measures are taken, and what is there a time reference? So I think that uh, skyrocketing wouldn't be the word I would use for CO2 emissions. Um, they're uh, they are increasing, uh, but uh, given the, um, the poverty that we're alleviating associated with uh, the CO2 emission increase, I think you know, most of us would say that, you know, that that's unfortunately probably the right trade-off. Um, so separately, you know, the, the challenge before us is not just to stop CO2 emissions, but to do it in a way that doesn't induce global poverty. And that's, uh, you know, you heard that in the lines that Jay was talking about in terms of we need to be able to make biofuels, but we know need to, we need to not compete with land where people grow food. So it doesn't make any sense to have, uh, be able to drive cars if we're starving people. Um, so we, we need to be careful about these trade-offs. But uh, um, there, are, there are opportunities, you know, we, we talked a little about electric cars. That's one strategy for being much more efficient in the transportation system. We can imagine changes in our land use so we could live closer to mass transit and uh, get over our COVID fears and use it again. Um, so there, I, I think there are opportunities and uh, strategies, but we have to intersect those with our strategies for global poverty to be fair and just at how we uh, think about CO2 emissions going into the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Peidong, uh, or maybe any of my three panelists, what are the breakthroughs necessary to drive down the price of green hydrogen? Mm. And Peidong, I look to you yeah. because I think of you as the person to know the answer. <laughs> um, I don't have the answer. Um, DOE is, uh, Department of Energy is investing uh, significantly in this uh, sort of trying to produce uh, renewable hydrogen or so-called green hydrogen from water using sunlight. Okay. So they have this uh, one, one, one earth shot program uh, in basically trying to produce green hydrogen uh, with a price of $1 per kilogram in one decade. Okay. So essentially our sort of mission is potentially we, we need to reach this goal within the next uh, 10 years. Okay. And is that, in terms of real solution, I mean, there are many different sort of a scientific approach towards that. And I feel, again, nanoscience can contribute a lot, uh, essentially designing better catalysts. Okay? And because nowadays the, the water electrolyzer um, in the commercial water electrolyzer, we use lots of these very expensive metal like palladium. Okay? So we need to discover basically uh, earth abundant catalyst to really do these water spreading using sunlight fairly, very effectively without losing too much energy. And the question is what this particular catalyst? Okay. So, so there are, again, lots of discovery efforts uh, has to be done in the next, uh, next few years. However, I would say the solar driven, solar based, solar based the water electrolyte technology is out there. It's feasible. Now it's the cost. So, and this is where the discovery new type of catalyst will help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Peidong. Uh, there's one more technical question I wanna jump on to with Jay, and then there's a, a whole series of questions that come down to, I think, one basic question. But let's, uh, let's start with Nick Schott's question about biofuel from waste forest products. Did you see that, Jay? Has anyone heard of biofuel from waste forest products to make fuel oil? What about the use of jet pumps to burn waste cellulosic, cellulosics or plastics? Yeah, so uh, there's lots of questions in there. So, uh, you know, I was talking about uh, forest waste. I think that was part of it. Uh, 
and making fuels. You know, one of the fuels that's that's going to be really needed in the future is fuels for large ships. They basically get kind of the bottoms of the refining process, and they get these uh, heavy oils. And so there's a lot of work going on now to try to replace those. And uh, getting those from forest waste is is one possibility. Um, uh, you know, in terms of burning plastics, I think uh, that's a that's a problem because uh, you're basically taking something that was made from petroleum uh, and combusting it. And, uh, you know, maybe you would get uh, something like, uh, um, you know, a fuel out of that, or maybe you would just make electricity. But anyway, you're, you're putting more carbon in the atmosphere that came from petroleum in the first place. So I think burning plastics is not a great solution. And Ron can probably say a lot more about that than I can. You want to comment, Ron? I, I, I'll just, I, you know, I can add that, you know, the, the things that are end up being most dangerous about burning plastics is that the things in them that are not carbon and hydrogen. So that the unintended byproducts of that combustion release toxics into the atmosphere. And so, you know, if, if it was just uh, polyethylene, you could probably burn that more safely than PVC, for example. So it's which plastic really matters when you say that. Yeah, let me, um, there, are, there are a whole host of questions that are related to the relationship between science, technology, government, <laughs> policy, and economics. Just a few uh, light topics. What I would like to do uh, to challenge my colleagues a little bit is I would like to in turn sort of ask you um, sort of this bigger question the anonymous attendee earlier in the talk talked about, um, you know, the IPCC report has laid out uh, what the consequences of climate change, uh, the atmosphere is changing, the change is due to us, there are consequences, the IPC reports have made that all very clearly. And then the question is, well, what about what about our relationship with the political and social structures that enable climate change? And do we have a responsibility to deal with that? And if so, what is that responsibility? So nice, easy questions, Pedong and Jay and Ron for you to tackle. And I might say something too after I have a moment to process, but um, I'm just going to mute myself and let one of you jump in first and talk about this big picture problem. So let me jump in first. I, I think you know, one thing is to say there's not one right answer to that. That different scientists have different levels of skill in their own science and in their public engagement. And we should all, you know, in the moment, find the right balance for us as individuals and for, and, and where, and think carefully about where we can be most effective. So the IPCC report itself is a major scientific activity, mostly science, but it's an incredibly important vehicle for uh, public engagement and engaging governments. And so I wouldn't want anyone to think that that's, you know, Although it's more or less getting, you know, half the climate scientists on the planet to write a review paper together every 10 years. Um, and, you know, if I see you, you know, you can imagine what it's like to get everyone to agree on a review paper. Uh, but it, but it is uh, government engagement in that way. And then there are uh, other ways where we can individually choose to be effective in our own work. We felt in, in my research group that we can contribute more by going into K-12 classrooms than we can by going directly to legislators. But that's the choice of where we feel we can be most effective and where our skills as students and educators are best used. And I know other scientists who are absolutely fabulous walking in the halls of government and their skills are best used there. And so one is we shouldn't all do the same thing and we should uh, figure out where our skills are best used. But it's also, it's, it's essential that we communicate the difference between what it is we know about how the planet will work and then choices that involve human values between real choices. So it's not, it's not a given that, uh, you know, oh, it's better to not say, suffer the consequences of a warming planet uh, and uh, and live with that. You know, there are there are values implied in saying that's not okay. 
values about our environment, values about, you know, that will mostly come to play in the cost of urban infrastructure, the implied sea level rise and the cost to, that we will inevitably spend on urban infrastructure to move highways that are now at sea level up and all kinds of other things uh, that are associated with sea level and change in storminess and water availability for farming. We could choose to say that it's okay, we'll just manage those things as they come at us. And that would be one ch political choice in the values. And we can choose to say we should spend money now to prevent those outcomes because in the long run, life on earth will be better and will be more efficient use of dollars. But we should acknowledge that those are real choices and they're choices with trade-offs and they're trade-offs that involve people's immediate livelihoods and their job today. Uh, that some people will be put out of work as we change industries and those people will feel threatened and we need to watch out for them. So yeah, we thanks, can talk. Brian. Hey, Dong or Jay, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Um, I, I'm very concerned about um, the lack of interest of, of the public and government in science um, and the disregard for science. And I think we've seen that uh, with climate. We've also seen it with the pandemic. And uh, I agree with Ron, we need to, to act at all levels and, and try to engage the public in any way we can. Um, because if if the public and government completely or continue to disregard science, um, we certainly won't go in the right direction, I think. And so I, I do think we all need to be engaged in it um, at all levels. Hey, Don, you want to add? Yeah, may, maybe I can address this the balance of this basic and applied research. I, I think as scientists, we all trying to sort of, uh, in the lab, we want to develop new materials, new technology to address many of these uh, societal uh, problems, energy and environmental problems. Uh, so there is a balance here that um, the, between the basic and the applied research. On one side, of course, we, as scientists, we all look for big breakthroughs um, in the sort of in the laboratory scale. However, the, the question or the, the problem we are, we are talking about today is, is a much, much bigger one. So just the basic sort of uh, uh, science breakthrough may, may, or may, may not actually eventually solve our energy environmental issues. So we need actually very balanced applied research to push these basic science breakthrough into the market. And that's something I, I think the government can do a lot more uh, in many of these cases. Uh, for example, we talk about green hydrogen. Um, that's, uh, I'm glad right now see, see in the government are putting lots of sort of federal money to push those technology. And the, to go, go even sort of a little bit earlier, the photovoltaic industry is much, much sort of uh, invented much, much earlier time, very well established. However, we are nowadays, if we look back, the whole sort of the percentage of the solar energy in our whole energy portfolio is still at single digit level. This is after the invention of the solar cell now, I think it's 60, 70 years ago. Okay, and this is something that I think uh, both the public and the industry and the government can do more. And the, this tap in order to really getting into these carbon neutral, carbon negative society, the utilizing the renewable energy, especially solar energy is the key. I, I, that's my personal opinion. So, so we need to basically from all sects, we need to do our best to really push these, uh, any of these basic science breakthrough into the market and they're trying to utilize them in the maximum sort of level. Yeah, thanks, Peidong. Um, uh, I'm going to just offer a few comments of my own. Uh, Carrie, Connor, and uh, several of these, you, thank you for coming. It's good to, good to see you here. Um, I think Ron's point is a good one that each of us have a calling to take action on this. That, that action might be neighborhood groups and it might be advocacy. In my case, um, as Doug well knows, I've 
sort of develop the talk I give to student groups, churches, synagogues, old folk homes, libraries, you know, any, any organization that will take me uh, in which I try to talk about um, climate change and, and the consequences of combustion towards climate change. So that's my, one of my ways. But uh, I also was involved in a student-led um, class last year in which some difficult questions were posed about the powers and principalities that govern our lives and that those powers and principalities may in fact be flawed. And um, it's, these are difficult questions to ask in the United States at the present time, but I'm gonna put in the chat room here, uh, sorry, in the, um, yeah, in the chat box, there's a fascinating book called Ministry of the Future. It's written by um, a science fiction author named Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, Stan lives in Davis, a very prolific and famous author. Uh, and this book, uh, got a lot of attention. It's a wonky, scientist-friendly book, but maybe not so friendly to the rest of the world. But it's, uh, it's his uh, perspective on what has to change, why free market capitalism uh, can be um, a problem, and how it can be adopted or adapted uh, to yield the kind of solutions we need. So the book has a very happy ending, but it's a long slog to get there. But it reveals a lot of interesting issues about policy, politics, scientists, uh, and so forth. So um, it's a really great read. I recommend uh, that you read it. Uh, Barack Obama loved it, if that means anything to you. So uh, that's a good choice. Let me just check and see here if there's other questions that we haven't answered. Um, let me just walk through here and my colleagues, if you see anything else. Uh, yeah, so Corey, this is an interesting question. I think uh, Peidong answered it all for us all, which is that we don't use enough solar energy and we certainly should be using more. Uh, I, I'd be willing to bet that most of us are keen on, on wind, but uh, you know, wind has some, some challenges for storage, as does solar, but certainly wind has some challenges for storage, which no doubt Peidong's nanotechnology will help, will help resolve, right Peidong? Um, uh, let me just uh, look at any recent ones. Hi, Gaurav, nice to see you again. Um, so Connor asked this point, uh, which has come up uh, uh, maybe for me, actually I had protesters come to a talk I gave once at UC Santa Barbara, which is um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you avoid the perception that uh, major uh, principalities like oil and gas industries aren't going to use your technology to, to further uh, carbon uh, emissions. And, uh, you know, I, I'll just speak, I think all, th all three of our speakers have spoken today about how their intentions are to minimize this. And uh, what, car what Exxon does or whatever with our technologies may not be completely in our control. But um, I don't know, colleagues, do you want to comment on that? I'm not seeing a lot of hands waving up and down. Oh, so I think, you know, there, if we avoid the specifics of who is responsible for immediate uh, emissions and whatnot, the, even the current, you know, not quite effective enough government policies are pushing us uh, to measure the amount of CO2 released to the atmosphere and to drive that number down. So I think, you know, there's two really interesting experiments in that space going on. In California, there's a cap and trade program. The price is not high enough yet, but the price will go up. The framework is in place. I think the, perhaps the more interesting one is the limit on CO2 emissions from buildings in New York City, where I, if I understand the tax rate right now, it's gonna be about $260 a ton equivalent for building emissions in Manhattan. And so that's starting to get interesting. Uh, I don't know that they have any way for uh, taking Jay's biofuels and calling them zero yet, but they should. Uh, but it's, it's driving a lot of innovation. And uh, there are people who were willing to spend a lot just to not pay taxes. Just the idea that it's a tax is annoying enough to some people that they're willing to spend things that are not economically wise to uh, avoid those CO2 emissions. So it's an interesting, I think that's one of the more interesting experiments out there and one we should all be watching closely. 
I'm going to uh, take uh, presumption here in the last uh, couple, two, three minutes we have together and ask my panelist friends uh, a follow up on a question that was in the chat room. Are you optimistic or not? Yes, absolutely. I think the, the timing will be slower than any of us would like. But uh, there's lots of evidence that we're moving on a trajectory, despite the, you know, the complete inaction or negative work of in the during the Trump years. We still made tremendous progress uh, reducing CO2 emissions in the United States. Uh, there are lots and lots of cities that are, and this is where our own research is trying to focus. Cities are the place where most CO2 emissions happen, and they're places where uh, people are running for election on reducing their CO2 emissions. So one of the goals in our current research is to provide people real-time feedback on urban CO2 emissions so that if someone does choose to run for election on that, they can run for re-election re four years later saying that they did what they said, or someone else can run and say you didn't do what you said uh, with the scientific basis for uh, looking at that. Jay? Yes, I'm optimistic. Hey, Don? Yeah, same here. Uh, uh, I am. Uh, I think we are making progress. We are moving in the right direction. But again, we need to do more. Yeah, am I optimistic? Oh, yeah, I'm really optimistic. And I, the reason I, I can say this is because when you're at a place like Berkeley and you engage with the kind of students we have, you see their vision for the future. You see their uh, incredible brilliance, and uh, and they're moving us. And you know, some of us are going to come along, uh, you know, kicking and screaming. But they are moving us. I'm really optimistic about where that is going. Uh, if I look in my community, carbon capture, sequestration, utilization, I look at that community. There's so many really good ideas uh, that are brewing up. Uh, I think we're going to make the 2050 uh, benchmark. Um, all of us are going to have to give up a little bit of the things we like, uh, but uh, but in general, I'm very optimistic, and I'm especially optimistic that so many of you came today to to hang out with us and to uh, hear the panel discussion. Uh, Jay Kiesling, Rod Cohen, Pei Dong Yang, and of course our illustrious Dean uh, Doug Clark. Thank you all for uh, showing up today, you guys, and and uh, and sharing this time with us. And uh, we're headed to spring break here at Berkeley, so we're all looking forward to, uh, to a few moments of time to think. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Have a great day and uh, go Bears. <laughs>